turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14, and uh, let's continue the study. As we've been looking at Revelation, in the book of Revelation, we have seen that, you know, there are um, incidents that are happening, events that are happening, and then there are interludes in between, or breaks from that narration to, uh, to give us a glimpse into various other aspects. Do you remember which was the first interlude that we saw? Where was the first break in the narration that we saw? Do you remember which chapter it was? Anyone? No? 12? Seven. Amu? Seven. Seven was the first one. Seven was the first one that we saw where uh, we were seeing scenes in heaven then the uh, seals being broken. And then in chapter seven, there was an interlude and we saw a group of people, right? How many were they in number? 144,000. 144,000. These are 144,000 missionaries that were picked up who needs to, uh, who have a specific role and who are protected throughout the seven year period. Okay, when, where was the second interlude that we saw? And again, remember that these are places where it's not the regular narration, but some things are happening. Where was the second interlude that we saw? Interludes are breaks between the sequence of events that were happening. Where is the second interlude? Okay. Before, earlier, I know Brian also said 12, but earlier to that, not really 12, because 12 is also a sequence of events. If you look at chapter 10, you see an interlude. Chapter 10 is an interlude of telling us of uh, things that are preparations that are taking place and of, um, you know, everything getting ready for the next trumpet. And chapter 11 then has the two witnesses, which is not an interlude, but it is part of the events, but we are taken back somewhere. Chapter 12 is taking us even further back and uh, giving us the, the vision of the battle of ages so that we understand. So 12 is not an interlude. 12 just steps back. Uh, you know, the, Chapter 11 is about the two witnesses. Chapter 12 takes us back. Chapter 13 was again, uh, taking us to two individuals. What? Who were the two individuals, uh, Sean? Mm, Brian? Mm, Brian? I think Sean's having that, some net issue. Brian, who were the two individuals that we met in chapter 13? Uh, Mr. Beast? Yeah, who are they? Jennifer? The Antichrist. The Antichrist and the, the second uh, beast is called the Amu. False prophet. False prophet. The Antichrist and the false prophet. Two individuals who are demon possessed and who then take uh, power and who are controlling the world. Uh, governments and the rule there, okay? I keep going back. The reason I'm recording these messages and uh, these classes and sending you the link is I want you to go back and review it. I, I find that, you know, of course, it's a difficult topic. If we don't review it, you will not get all the aspects. So please do go and review it. So chapter 13 starts with the dragon, the, be uh, the beast, and uh, the dragon or Satan or the old serpent standing at the uh, seaside, you know, the sea, uh, the, the seashore and the sea represents humanity and pulling out two individuals, one from the sea, one from the ground, one from humanity, from, from the people and one from the very place that um, is supposed to glorify God. And these two individuals, the beast out of the sea and the beast of the, out of the earth or the antichrist uh, and the false prophet together with Satan formed the unholy trinity, which during the seven year period wreck havoc, especially the second uh, part of that, the three and a half uh, years or the second part 
of the seven year, the second half of the seven year where they, where they are in total control of everything that is happening. Now, when we come into chapter 14, we see another one standing and we are going to look into that. But before we do that, as always, we also look at uh, the key words. Okay, turn with me to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7 being the key words. Okay, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Brian, can you read it, please? Which one, sir? Revelation? Chapter 7, verse 14. I answer, sir, you know. And he said, these are, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. No, no. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Did I say it the other way around? Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Did I say it the other way around? I'm sorry. It's, uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Yeah, it says here, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. In chapter 14, it's an interlude, a break where uh, from what we were seeing, and remember that we are now in the trumpet judgments, and before uh, we move to the next set of judgments, here we have a break, and there we see that God is showing us that even though it looks like the beast, uh, the antichrist and the false prophet, and they're going to be persecuting saints. And it looks like there is terrible uh, events that are taking place. And even though, even during that chapter, we were taught that these events would, uh, th that these uh, beasts and these human beings are there with power for a very short period of time. We see here that God is telling us, do not worry, saints. There is an end to this. The, uh, there is victory that is coming. And so we do not need to be afraid. So 14 is kind of giving us quickly a glimpse much further ahead than where we are in, in the timeline. Just to show us that there is an end, which is a victorious end. We do not have to worry about these human beings or this unholy trinity who have taken control of the earth. So in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, it says, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. That point of total judgment, the final judgment is, is upon us, that hour. So it's a very short period of time. And so we do not need to worry. We just need to continue to worship the creator God. Okay. From a timeline perspective, as I mentioned, when we look at this, we see uh, that We've been seeing this timeline, right? And we've been progressing across. So chapter 14 is kind of, there are a, a few angelic announcements that take place, which is in line with the timeline. But then it steps very quickly away to the end of the tribulation period. It, it goes to that end of the seven-year period and says, this is what is going to happen. Okay. You understand this? So chapter to 14 is very quickly giving us a view into uh, much further ahead in time to the end of that seven-year period and saying that this is what is going to happen. There is victory and that victory is a smashing victory, is a total victory and a total defeat of the enemy. So there's nothing to worry. And then is then it goes back to the narration that we see in chapter 15 and chapter 16. So 15 and 16 fall between this. 14 gives us a view of what is being announced now and what is going to happen later and then 15 steps back. So I hope you understand this. This is where it, it, the revelation gets a little confusing that if you do not understand that revelation keeps going forward, backward, just so that God is trying to give us a whole picture. As I mentioned to you earlier, always think of it like when you see a movie. Uh, you know, there are flashbacks there are sometimes uh, scenes of what is happening here and then there is a scene of what is happening there so that the author is trying or, or the movie creator, is scriptwriter is trying to bring us a complete picture of everything that is happening. So this is where we are at this point in time in chapter 14. So let us look into details of that. Okay, go into the first verse. It says, then I looked and there before me was the lamb 
standing on the mount. So like I said, if in, uh, you, you remember in chapter 13, uh, it says the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. That was 13 verse 1. 14 verse 1 says the lamb standing on Mount Zion. Okay. If you turn back to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6, we see this lamb standing again. Correct? We had already looked at that in the past. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Remember, we talked about this much earlier. We did chapter 6. When John was looking at that scene of the throne and sees um, the, um, the, the guard in his hand, that seven-sealed scroll, the right to the uh, to to the to the uh, to to the earth and to all that is within it, there was no one who was found worthy. And as John was weeping, he says, "The elders spoke to me, saying, Look, And when he looked, he saw the lamb that was slain, a slain lamb, a slaughtered lamb. You know, when a lamb was slaughtered, it never stands, right? It's dead, it's on the floor. But here is a lamb that was slain that was standing in the center of the throne. Why is he standing? Because even though he was slain, he was resurrected. Jesus Christ, the slain lamb of God, who shed his blood, but he was resurrected, stands in the center of the throne and stands there worthy to receive, worthy to take that scroll and to open it and read the judgment that is on it. And so here we see, when we come to verse one, we see the lamb standing again. But where is he standing now? He's not in heaven, he's not on the throne, uh, the throne room, but rather he is standing on Mount Zion. Now, if we look at it, the second aspect we see is uh, in, in this verse is standing on Mount Zion and with him, 144 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So when we come to Revelation chapter 7, we see uh, this 144,000, as we said, one of the interludes is, uh, turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. We see after these things, which are the things, whatever John has been seeing so far, um, John says, I saw another angel ascending in verse 2 uh, with having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither sea nor the trees, still we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. How many were sealed? And I heard the number of them in verse 4 that were sealed. There were, they were sealed and 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Very specific, a very specific number, 144,000. Very specific from where they come, from the children of Israel. They are Jewish people. You know, there is a, a, a group that believes today called Jehovah's Witness, and they say that whoever believes are the 144,000, and that number got crossed much later, uh, uh, much more than that, and still they believe that they are the 144,000. But here it's very specific. 144,000 got sealed. They are from the tribe of, if you read the subsequent verses, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Jiga, uh, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, so on. 12 tribes. 12,000 each, 144,000 missionaries were sealed. They were sealed for service to go and evangelize, to go and uh, share the gospel throughout the whole world. They were sealed in the beginning of the tribulation. They are sealed to pre preach the gospel throughout the seven-year period. And here they are, when we come to verse 1, at the end of the seven-year period, when Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, comes back to the earth, and when his feet touch the Mount, Mount Jerusalem. Now, where is the prophecy for that? Very quickly, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. And we see that uh, I just want to turn to one prophecy. Acts chapter 1, and you will see the prophecy there. You remember in Acts chapter 1, Jesus Christ was uh, slain. He was buried. He rose upon the third day. He spent uh, time, 49 days with the disciples at the end of that period he say he walks with them to mount zion the 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 mount and there we see that while they were talking to him he was lifted up into heaven 
uh, let us read verse uh, 9. And when we had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So here, it just picture in your mind, the disciples are standing on this mount, and as they're taking, uh, talking to him, he is just lifted up, lifted up, lifted up, and the clouds cover him. You know, when a plane takes off, eventually you cannot see the plane because the clouds cover the plane. The same way the Lord was taken up from the earth to a point where the disciples could not see him because the clouds had covered him. And then what do they hear? And while in verse 10, while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, two angels said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in the like manner as ye have seen him go to heaven. So here is a prophecy that uh, the way they have seen him taken up into heaven, the way that he was, you know, when they looked up and he, they saw him taken up into heaven, in the same way he is going to come back. Why are you gazing into heaven? He told you. You need to go to Jerusalem. You need to go and wait for the coming of the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit upon you. And then you need to go out and be my witnesses. So you don't need to stand here and keep looking. He is God, but he is going to come a second time. That is what the hope is. That is the promise. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we discussed before, is in two phases. In the first phase, he only comes in the midair. The earth does not see him. And the church... The dead and those who are alive will be caught up together as we did in uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and also in Corinthians chapter 15 is they will be caught up together and will meet him in the midair. The, the world does not see him. He does not come in glory and power. But the second time, and that is what Revelation chapter 14 is, the second phase of his second coming is when he will come and his feet will touch the earth. That is what Acts chapter 1, the, the disciples were told by the two men in Galilee. Uh, the two men saying, ye men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into heaven? This same Jesus whom you have seen taken up into heaven in the like manner will come and, his, and he will come on to, uh, to, to, to this mountain. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 14. There again, we see the same prophecy. I hope you are writing notes. Zechariah chapter 14, okay, is again talking about this second phase of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 14, I will read from verse 1. A day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather all nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured. The houses ransacked and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. This is the attack of the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist and his forces gathering together against the holy city, against Jerusalem, and bringing war and destruction. And this is allowed by the Lord. But notice verse 3, and Revelation chapter 14 is referring to this verse 3. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, this is, note this very carefully, this is the same as what is in Acts chapter 1 and also in Revelation chapter 14. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split into two halves, with each half the mountain moving north and half of the mountain moving south. Oh, what a blessed, blessed uh, test, uh, you know, prophecy it is that we have the Lord Jesus Christ coming down on the very mount from which he was taken up from Mount Olives. If the disciples were on Mount Olives and they saw him taking an, uh, taken up into heaven, he is going to come back to that very same mount, the mount where he left from. He comes, the mountain cleaves into two, and a huge valley is formed. Geologists, many years ago, went and, and uh, you know, they did a scan of this mount and they found that in the center of this Mount of Olives, there is a fissure, there is, the earth is weak there and any pressure that is applied on this, on the top of this mountain would split this mountain north, part north and part north, south, just like what the prophecy said. Isn't that amazing that science tries to disprove 
the Bible, and yet science fails to disprove and rather goes around proving the Bible. And so when we come to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, then I looked and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. So if in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3, we read that uh, there was a seal that was put on their foreheads and we didn't know what that seal contained. Here it says that the seal was their father's name, his father's name, the Lord Jesus Christ's father's name. God's name was stamped on them. A seal of ownership was put on them. And God said, this, these 144,000 missionaries are mine. You cannot touch them. You have no power over them. And so Satan and his forces, the Antichrist and the false with, uh, uh, prophet, try whatever they can to kill these and yet nothing is possible and they, they continue the seven years of continuing their ministry. Remember when we came to uh, chapter 12 in the last verse, also there was a seal. Do you remember that seal? The seal was a seal of 666, the mark of the beast. So those who followed the Antichrist, those who followed uh, Satan, they are also sealed because Satan copies everything that God wants to do, or God does, and so they're also sealed, but they are sealed with 666, the number uh, of man, this is the mark of the beast, the, the Satan's mark, and he is taking ownership of them. But that's just a copy, because way before that, in the beginning of the seven-year period itself, God marked these 144,000 with his name, and they are protected. Now, who, these 144,000, as they continue to proclaim the gospel and as they preach, many will come. People from all over will come and grab them and say, oh, what you are saying is true and we want to follow you because we hear that there is safety with you. In Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 23, you have it on the screen. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language of nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man. The Jewish man is these 144,000 and their followers saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The 144,000 are protected. They are missionaries. They are from Israel. They are from the 12 tribes. It's 12,000 from each tribe. And they go around the world proclaiming the gospel. And as you can see here, for every man, 10 men will join them and, and, uh, and the multitude grows. And that is why we read in chapter 7 that there was a, a large multitude that was there who, uh, who were following him. Now, as we said, his feet will land on Mount Zion. We already saw that in the Mount of Olives. In Psalm chapter uh, Psalm two and uh, verse uh, in, in Psalm two it says, "I have verse one. I have set my king on the on on my holy hill of Zion. Zion, the Jerusalem, and this Mount of Olives is the target, is the focus, and that is where the Lord is going to land. The same thing in Psalm forty eight also it says, "Great is the Lord in the city of our God in His." Holy mountain is Mount Zion. We read those in the verses. I, I've, I've merged a few verses there. But go and if you read verse 48, you read that God is great and he is going to be on his mountain, Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem. Uh, Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 23 says, The Lord of hosts will reign on my, Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. This is going to be the headquarters of the new kingdom that is going to be established, the kingdom that is... Um, is, is the Lord's and the rain will be from there. This is the preparation for the seven, uh, the thousand year rule that is going to follow. When we come to verse two and three, we read verse two and three reads, and I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters, like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harp. There is great celebration. It's a roar. It's, it's a deaf roar of joy in heaven because this is what they've been waiting for. The victory is, uh, is theirs. The, the enemy has been defeated and they uh, uh, rejoice and play the harps. And they sang a new song. Notice this. 
before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. There is a new song now, a song that has never been sung, which is being sung. Notice who can sing this song. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are they, and then there are a few characteristics told about these 144,000. They have not defiled themselves with women. In other words, they are virgins. Their focus is only on serving Christ and proclaiming the gospel. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So they are the closest to the Lamb, and they follow Him wherever they go. They do not leave His side. Uh, the third one is they are purchased from men and uh, men and offered as first fruits to God. They are the first fruits after the rapture of the church. They are the first to come to Christ after all believers, after the church, dead and alive, have been taken out from this earth. They are the first fruits. They are the first believers. Uh, and then from them, many, many more will come. And they are blameless. In verse 5, it says that they are blameless. So, this is the 144,000 standing along with the Lamb. As we said, they do not leave his side. Standing along with the Lamb as the Lamb comes down to establish his kingdom. Now, there are some angelic announcements that happen after this. In fact, there are three angelic announcements. Uh, we read one of them as the theme, theme verse, but we will go back and look at it. Notice in this now we will see about six or seven different angels that will be coming and they have various uh, uh, ministries or uh, roles that they have to play, but we will look at each one of them, okay? Uh, in verse six, then I saw another angel uh, flying in the midair and he had the eternal gospel to present. So not only are the 144,000 proclaiming the gospel, but we see they're supporting the 144,000. If you remember from chapter 11, the two witnesses, right? who we believe are Moses and Elijah, they are supporting with signs and wonders and everything. And God is giving everybody an opportunity that they will never say that I never heard the gospel. Here is an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. And they are preaching to everyone who dwells on the earth. So there is no way anybody who is living in that time would be able to say, I didn't know. 144,000 missionaries going around the world, the two witnesses with all their signs and wonders supporting them, and an angel proclaiming the gospel and flying all around the earth proclaiming it. And that's where we read verse 7 saying, His message is pure God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made heaven and the earth, the sea and the spring of waters. There is a clear gospel that is presented saying fear God, give glory to God worship the creator, worship the one who is sustaining and notice one thing very specifically, it says the one who made the heaven and the earth the sea and the spring of waters when we come into the judgment we have already looked at two sets of judgments we see that God in his judgment is attacking these very same elements that we have seen then the second angel comes, okay in verse 8, a second angel followed and his news or his message is very different. He is talking about defeat that is coming in. He is talking about a war which is leading to destruction. He says, um, and a second angel followed in verse 8 and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. So here is a proclamation that Mankind, if you think Babylon, and Babylon stands for the power base of the devil and the, and the Antichrist, we will see this in, uh, in the subsequent chapters, but it says here that already there is an announcement that this is for destruction. Babylon will not last. It will be destroyed. The, then a third angel comes. And what is the third angel's message? A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships a beast, his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Oh, what a terrible, terrible announcement it is. So the first angel proclaimed the gospel. Worship God. Give glory to God. Follow God. And uh, follow the creator. The second angel said, what is coming is destruction. Everything that you see now of power will be destroyed. 
The third angel says, if you follow the beast, if you follow this defeated enemy, then there is wrath that is going to be poured out on you. That wrath is the full cup of his indignation. Indignation means his anger, his rage, God's anger against sin and rebellion. The cup with its full strength, the very cup in the Garden of Gethsemane that the Lord Jesus Christ had to drink. The cup that the Lord said, Lord, if it is your will, let this cup pass away. That cup of judgment, the cup of the wrath of God, which Lord Jesus Christ drank so that the wrath that was against you and against me for the sins that we have done, for the wrong that we have done, for the rebellion that we have showed in our lives, Jesus Christ drank it all so that we were saved from that wrath and that indignation. But here is a warning by the angel saying, if you, people of this world, if you, any one of you, you follow the beast, if you worship him, if you take the mark, which we saw in Revelation chapter 13 at the end, if you take the mark of the beast on your forehead or on your hand, this terrible cup of indignation, this cup of wrath, is going to be poured out on you. You will suffer the consequences of it. Now, this cup has also been mentioned many times in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 7, uh, sorry, Psalm 75 and verse 8, it says, For in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup and the wine is red. It is fully mixed. In other words, it is mixed with God's anger and wrath and he pours it out. Surely, the dregs shall have all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. In other words, what God has planned and what God has decreed as a judgment against sin and against rebellion, that every human being will have to drink of this uh, who is in rebellion to God. Everyone who has taken the mark of the beast or has taken... And, uh, and is worshipping uh, the beast, the Antichrist. In Isaiah 15, verse 17, it says, Ye who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling, you have drained to the dregs. Drained to the dregs means, dregs means what is remaining. Uh, uh, like in Malayalam, we say the mutt. You know, like when you drink tea, at the end, there is this bitter residue of the tea leaves that are remaining right we normally don't drink that if, if you drink tea what you do is when, when you sip it when it comes to the last you don't drink it it's bitter it's it's the it's too bitter to drink but here it says that they will be made to drink to the last to the dregs to the complete uh, that it is drained out completely this is the lord's anger and then at the same time there is a comfort, a word of comfort that is given, not to these people, not to those who are going to face God's wrath, but rather to those who are believers. What does it say in the next verse? It says that, sorry, uh, in, in verse 13, let us look at verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed are though the dead who die in the Lord. So even as this wrath is being poured out on the worshippers of the beast, on, on those who have taken the mark of the beast, at the same time it says that blessed are the dead in Christ, the, those who have died in the Lord. There, are, there will be many who will be tortured. There will be many who will have to die for the faith. And to them it is told that they are blessed because it says, they will rest from their labor from their, and their deeds will follow them. So three declarations, three angels declaring three things. Worship God. That was the first declaration. The second was defeat is coming. And the third is judgment is coming. And those, if you do not worship God, then there is severe judgment that is to follow. Following this from verse 14 onwards, it's divided into uh, a reaping, a harvest of the earth. It is the reaping of the uh, harvest. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ was on this earth, he said that a time will come when there is going to be a reaping, when uh, the, the wheat and the tares or the weed have been growing together, there will be a reaping. The wheat will be put into the barnyard, but the tares or the weed 
will be taken and burned. Here also, there is going to be a harvest that is coming. And that is what we see here. And I uh, looked in verse 14, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, having in the, on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, this could represent the Lord Jesus Christ, because the way it talks, especially like the Son of Man, it could be a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a crown that is on his head, which again represents probably uh, the crown that he, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the, the, his, uh, the, the fact that he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in his hand, he's holding a sickle. So this could be the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not know. And, I, and I'll explain to you why we are not fully sure of it. it is because when we go to the next verse, we see that an angel, remember I told you the angels are very, in this chapter, there are a lot of angels. And so in, in the next verse, it says, then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, an angel telling the Lord what to do does not seem to be, you know, it's the other way around. The Lord should be telling the angel what to do rather than the angel telling the Lord what to do, which is one of the reasons that we are not really sure if this um, character is the Lord himself. However, it could be that because we read that the angel is coming from the temple, it could also be that God has sent a message to the sun saying it is time to reap the earth. We do not know, but anyway, the message here or the symbolism here is the earth has to be reaped. In verse 16, we read, so he who was seated on the cloud swung a sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. What does this mean? What is this harvest? What exactly is happening here? It is that preparation for judgment that is going to be poured out on the earth. It is judgment against the unbelievers. And the harvest here is possibly the harvest of the believers or harvest of the millennial saints, uh, sorry, the tribulation saints, before God's wrath is poured out on the rest of the people. In Joel chapter 3, verse 9 to 13, we read, Proclaim this among the na nations. Prepare for war. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Put in your sickle, sickle for your harvest is ripe. So, Whenever we talk about harvest, we harvest good stuff. We don't harvest weeds, right? When, we, when a farmer goes out to harvest, he is not harvesting the weeds. He is not harvesting crop that is useless. He is harvesting what he has planted and the seed he wants to take or the benefit he wants to take out of that harvest. So the harvest here is a, a portrayal of what is, uh, what is the fruit that God has been looking for or what he has been planting, and that is missionary ministry of the 144,000. That is the ministry of the angel that, uh, that is flying with the gospel. Uh, the eternal gospel is also the ministry of the two witnesses. M uh, millions have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, what we term as the tribulation saints, and now they are harvested or they are collected so that they are not part of what is going to follow, the wrath that is going to follow, the judgment that is going to follow. Uh, why do we say this? Because also, if you remember, in Egypt, when the plagues were happening, we keep reading on and on again that the land of Goshen was protected. That the plagues did not affect the people of Israel who were living in the land of Goshen. God protects his people before he puts, uh, he takes action against the rebellion and, and pours out his judgment. So here is a harvest of the earth where there is a collection of all those who are believers. Now, in verse 17, we see another angel, a fifth angel. So, uh, it, it, you know, if, you, if we count the, uh, in verse 14, the one who is on a white cloud to be an angel, then this is the sixth angel. Otherwise, let's say it is the fifth angel. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. So notice, he's also coming from the temple. So these angels are being sent out uh, as messengers, as messengers, or as those who have to take certain action, and this angel is also having a sharp sickle. 
but he is not a glorious angel yeah there is in much of an explanation about him but we see that he also comes with a sickle you know and then another angel so here is the sixth angel or the seventh angel depending on how you count was 14 to be angel or not still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle so the sickle that the uh, that this angel has is a sharp sickle compared to in 14 also there was an angel with a sharp sickle but the instructions that they given is very different take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's wine because its grapes are ripe so here is another so the harvest we think of wheat or the wheat fields here is this sickle is being put into cutting out the grapes the grapes are ripe and cut this out what does it say the angel swung his sickle on the earth gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of god's wrath it is being so this this is not good right these grapes are symbolizing not a believer but somebody who is a, who who is rebellious right because it says here this gathering together of cutting out these grapes because the grapes are fully ripe are thrown into the great wine press of the wrath of god it is again uh, so if the first part of the harvest was the harvesting of god's people the second is a collection of all of those who are unbelievers who are to be thrown into the wine press of god and it says here that they are to be trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flowed out of the press rising as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of 1600 stadia in revelation chapter 19 and verse 15 when we look at the battle of armageddon when we come to that final battle we read there of the same terminology that is used he treads the wine press of the fury of god's god almighty there it is the lord jesus christ himself treading stamping busting getting out all the jews taking total uh, action against the unbelievers against rebellion and blood flowed from the press blood flows and how high is it as high as a horse's bridle you know the horse its head is quite high and uh, so uh, maybe a meter or meter and a half blood up to that level at that height and 1600 stadia or as as long uh, as around 300 kilometers this is how high and as long that this blood has flown this is Uh, when when the mountain split as we read earlier and we will come back to this and talk a little bit more in revelation chapter 19 is the valley that is created the valley of jehoshaphat around 300 kilometers long this valley is filled with the blood of those who are rebellious and it it, it flows there for 300 kilometers and the height of about a meter to a meter and a half you can imagine how much how many were killed and their blood was shed the wine press of god's wrath the, the 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 crushing of those who are rebellious and their and the blood flowing out of their bodies isaiah chapter 34 verse 7 and 8 6 and 7 says the land will be drenched with blood the, this land of uh, the, the near jerusalem will be drenched with blood because the lord of the the, the sword of the lord is bathed with blood lord himself creates a great slaughter there we will again come back to these chapters isaiah 34 and uh, the other chapters and we will talk about even isaiah chapter 6 uh, and we will talk about uh, 63 and we will talk about various aspects of this war the battle what is known as the battle of armageddon the war in the valley of jehoshaphat when we come to chapter 19 turn with me to isaiah chapter 63 and uh, verse 1 and let's read a few verses like i said we will come back to it but i just want to turn to it very quickly here isaiah chapter 63 and reading from verse 1 okay, it says here who is coming from edo from bozrah with his garments stained crimson 
who is this robed in splendor striding forward in the greatness of his strength it is i speaking in righteousness mighty to save these are all symbolisms uh showing the battle that is going to come when the lord jesus christ doesn't come as a savior doesn't come as a carpenter of nazareth doesn't come hidden in the in the mid air so that he can take his children to him but comes as a victor comes as one who crushes rebellion comes as one who is ready for battle and who is going to shed blood in verse 2 there is a question that is asked why are your garments red and in verse 3 the answer is there i have trodden the wine press alone he has the power he has the authority and he is going to trod the wine press he is going to you know that picture there in your mind should be in the olden days what they would do is take the grapes put it into large containers wooden containers you know and then uh, people would get into this container these are large containers you know they were wooden containers they would get into it with their feet i mean obviously clean feet but they would walk get into it and with their feet they would keep stamping the grapes and stamping the grapes and keep stamping the grapes you know crushing it crushing it crushing it and the grape juice would flow out of it through um, you know like slats that were there in the wooden um, base so that the juice would come out this is how they would crush of course today they have machinery that does that but in those days it was human beings who would do it and that is the picture that is here the lord jesus christ these grapes this, these people of rebellion are gathered together and he just crushes them i mean this is symbolism don't think that he's actually going to come here and stamp everyone and you know like this big foot that is coming and smashing uh, the enemy okay it is just symbolism but it is to show a battle it is to show that blood is going to be shed people are going to be killed the enemy is going to be killed and we will see when we come to chapter 19 that it is a huge army a large army we saw in zechariah chapter 4 also that is coming against jerusalem and they have been trodden they have been squashed they have been smashed and in verse 4 it's it is me for the day of vengeance the year for me to redeem has come this is the redemption of god's people this is god the lord jesus christ acting against the enemy and defeating them to redeem his people the people of israel in verse 6 it says i trampled the nations in my anger and poured their blood on the ground how much of blood was it it was 300 kilometers long the blood flowing the there was it was almost like a river of blood 300 kilometers long and about 1 to 1 and a half meter high that's the amount of blood the battle of armageddon the battle in the valley of jehoshaphat is a terrible battle and that battle the victor there is there can only be one victor and that is our lord jesus christ and so in chapter 14 verse 20 we come to that the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press even unto the horses bridle by the sound by the space of 2600 furlongs or 1600 stadia or this is about 300 kilometers 180 miles that's how the enemy is going to be defeated the antichrist the false prophet and satan will bring a large army against the city of god against jerusalem to defeat it once and for all they will be victorious initially but then we will come to revelation chapter 19 the lord jesus christ descends from heaven arrayed in battle ready for battle with the armies of heaven following and that battle of armageddon will be a total defeat for the unholy trinity and the army that was with him will be completely destroyed and they will be um killed completely their the blood will flow there that's what we saw but as we saw from the angelic announcements those who were on the earth and acknowledge god's greatness and to worship him but they refuse and because they refuse they will be judged terribly babylon is fallen babylon the great city the city that stood against god not the babylon of old but the new babylon that will be raised up will be destroyed completely and 
God would bring his established Judas Iscariot and a lot of his followers uh, thought that he had come to establish a kingdom. And that is why Judas was very upset and he even betrayed the Lord because he thought, Lord, you came to establish a kingdom. You're not doing it. At least if I put you in, you know, if I, if I, if I have the Jewish people catch you and put you in, maybe at that time you will display your power and you will break free and come. You know, this is what Judas thought. Judas never understood that the Lord Jesus Christ had come as a savior of the world. Peter didn't understand that. You know, when Peter was asked, like, who are you? Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ asked, who do people say I, say I am? He said, you are the son of God. He understood that. But then when the Lord Jesus Christ said that I am going to die, uh, he said, no, Lord, you cannot. And that is why the Lord rebuked him. The Jewish people were looking for a Messiah, a, a, a kingmaker, a, a, a king, a prince to come and deliver them from oppression and establish a kingdom that has not happened it will happen it was a promise it was a prophecy that was given to them and that a uh, line uh, uh, heir from the line of david would rule forever that has not yet happened but it will happen god had promised it it has promised it it will happen but it is in the future it is going to be a time when there is when rebellion has reached its highest level when Satan has uh, has created all of the forces to be against God, that the Lord will come to defeat that is carved out of with, without hands, and that smashes the uh, statue at its feet and uh, destroys it completely and becomes a mountain. That is the um, prophecy of the millennial kingdom it is going to take place praise God we are part of that kingdom praise God that we are on the Lord's side praise God God has given you an opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior like the angel proclaim the eternal gospel share with your friends that there is danger there is destruction there is wrath that is coming and so to be safe let us pray Father God, we thank you for this time you've given us that we could all be in your presence and could um, study from the book of Revelation. We thank you for all that is revealed to us. Lord, you are a God who reveals your plans to your people. Uh, you've done that with the children of Israel. You've done it with us. And pray that these would all encourage and motivate us to be those who have a burden for the gospel and who share with uh, the perishing souls around us. Bless these boys and girls. And help them in their studies, help them in their spiritual life, that the study of the book of Revelation and uh, their own personal studies would bless them to have a perfect walk with you. Thank you for this time. We ask your blessings upon uh, each one of us. Till we meet again, we commit us into your loving hands in the precious name of God and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.